Good morning, good morning. Um, welcome back, um, and thank you for yesterday. I don't know about you, but I had a hard time shutting my brain down uh, last night. Um, uh, incredible discussion. Um, this morning, Malcolm is going to sort of um, kick us off this morning with some reflections on yesterday. Um, and then after Malcolm, we're going to try to capture in the model your conversation from yesterday and sort of run that by you. So that's the plan for this first section. So Malcolm, give us your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Aaron, and, and, and good morning to, to, to those survivors. Uh, it always fascinates me in the last day of the conference, you know, there's a third of the people who started out in the beginning, but you're the real survivors, the real contributors, so we're expecting a lot of contribution today as we try and wrap up this uh, unwinding ball of, uh, of, of yarn. Um, so I, I, I did spend a, a few minutes last night, probably not enough time, uh, thinking uh, about what we have learned and trying to isolate some of the key issues or principles, uh, and that's why I have my computer with me. Um, first of all, the model. Now, you know, people have different views of models, but I think that they're really important. And I think they're important for a number of reasons. They provide a framework, in our case, an inventory of drivers for thinking about the issues. You don't have a model, you sort of tend to forget about some of the perhaps initially more peripheral issues. If you have it up there, it reminds you to think about categories of issues. So I think it provides that framework. Uh, perhaps more importantly, within that framework, it provides for identification of potential or real problems, or problems that you didn't even think were problems until you started looking at it. Uh, so mismatches, for example, between demand and supply, and the other mismatches that the, that the uh, group talked about yesterday. So that's from a therapeutic perspective, in, 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 in essence, uh, to, to look for solutions. Um, and it provides the identification and testing of these potential solutions. This is what has been referred to as the levers, uh, and, and I think that's perhaps most important of all. Um, Models are mutate. They're, they're, they're not a model or the model. That they, that they are models that uh, need to be refined. And so they're iterations of models. So, so having a starting model, I think, is very useful. Um, ha having said that, uh, models need to be flexible because of the contextual issues of the local context and national context, which are quite different and which impact models or emphasize one piece of a model and de-emphasize another piece uh, progressively. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the types of models, static, dynamic, and predictive, but ultimately, as you go through iterations of the models, what you want to end up with is something that can predict and you can test the predictions and see how useful that model is. So I think the model is really useful as a think exercise, if nothing else. Uh, now, uh, what about the demand side? I, I, I think the key issue on the demand side to me, as I mentioned yesterday, is, is rethinking needs, perceived and real. Now, it's easy enough to say, well, there are perceived needs and there are probably some real needs that the public or the communities that we serve need. <clears throat> but it's more complicated than that because who is the arbiter of these needs? Do we in a paternalistic or mixed paternalistic, maternalistic sense uh, uh, arbitrate what those needs are or does the public? Well, it clearly is the public and the question is how does the public get into that arbiter role? Um, so it's not just a matter of trying to define differences between real and perceived needs. It's how you manage that. Uh, and another problem uh, uh, r related to that is who speaks for the public? Is it Big Brother? Is it local or national policymakers? 
And it really is a political process. And so we need to get engaged in the political process, both locally, regionally, and nationally, if we're going to have any impact on any of this. Uh, and politics shouldn't be a dirty word, although it's become a dirty word, unfortunately. I mean, without them, I and that's the conduit by which public needs uh, are expressed and modulated. And I think that the role of health, uh, uh, the role of community education in this is really cr critical. How you, the question you need to ask yourself is how do we as health professionals help fill that information gap? We talked about information gaps yesterday. How do we really educate the public? And we don't do enough of that, to be quite honest. And I think it's absolutely critical that we do that. Uh, a few thoughts about social and economic return. We sort of expanded from social to social and economic return, although in my own view, economic return is part of social return because it's the currency with which we, we work. Uh, but however you want to think about that, how do we define the social return or the economic return? How do we quantitate it once we've defined what we're talking about? What are the outcome metrics and analyses? What are the returns on investment? Uh, social returns, economic returns, however you want to think about it. And how big should the metric scope, the scope of metrics? We keep talking, and it's, it's become a cliche. You have to measure stuff. Well, that's absolutely correct. The metrics are important, but sometimes we get subsumed by metrics. There's so many metrics and there's so many uncertainties on how best to measure things that we, 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 we look at, uh, at the trees instead of the forest. You only need a few metrics to get going. And, uh, and I would suggest that, uh, and here health professionals can be particularly helpful, that simple metrics like the workforce type and distribution or numbers and distribution of the workforce are metrics that we've had I think in almost every state in this country uh, for decades. It's not that those metrics are not available. So the argument, well, you can't do anything because you can't measure it, I think is nonsense. I think there are some metrics, uh, uh, and, and I would suggest that you think about focusing on metrics that are easily at hand as opposed to worrying about the whole universe of metrics. Now, on the supply side, this particularly uh, applies to, to us as health professionals. Uh, I mean, it seems to me there's some relatively simple things. And we heard in, in some of the examples yesterday uh, that were given us uh, some of the supply side issues that really do make a difference. Uh, for example, we heard from Walter Sisulu University, and I grew up in South Africa, so I sort of know some of the the, the history of, of, of that institution, uh, although it wasn't in existence when I was there as a, as a younger man. Uh, but admissions criteria, where you select your students from, if they come from the community, they're likely to go back to the community. Big surprise. But that's been shown over and over and over again. And Dr. Chitwa mentioned that to us uh, yesterday, uh, uh, for example. Uh, the curriculum. I mean, people sitting in this room control, in one way or another, uh, the curriculum. Uh, if you put people in community training sites, they're likely to understand community needs better than those who learn in hospitals, entirely in hospitals. So these are some factors that are actually relatively simple for people in this room to, to modulate, to work with. Um, so, uh, and debt relief we talked a lot about, increasingly important as a supply side determinant of, of health professional, uh, professional growth and choice. Uh, the key levers, uh, incentives we talked about. Incentives are not the only levers, but they are important levers. Um, again, they, they don't have to be earth shattering although sometimes small changes are viewed as earth-shattering. And a good example of that is what happened with the IOM GME report, right? The GME report, in essence, said, let's take a portion of the money 
not away from GME funding, but let's label it and use it in a different way for an innovation fund so that there were some resources available to begin to fund some projects and pilots and some thinking about how it really needed to be changed. That wasn't a revolutionary change. Now, maybe something's going to come from that, maybe something isn't. Some people are more optimistic about that than others, but it certainly uh, was viewed as this cataclysmic change uh, in the Medicare funding of, of GME, and it really wasn't much of a cataclysmic change. So one hopes that sometimes these small changes, or what I like to think of as soft transitions, the importance of incrementalism, you know, policy changes don't come from huge, abrupt changes. They come from incremental small steps at a, at a time. And I think the group here can, can, can be the authors of some of that incremental change. Uh, another uh, 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 key incentive uh, uh, or lever uh, is common accreditation or different ways of thinking about accreditation. That was a previous workshop, but it relates to this and came up before. So these are some of the demand side, supply side, and levers that I think uh, the group has been struggling with. So what can you do to help move this along? This is what co-chairs of these meetings get asked the whole time as if we have a magic wand that we can say, ding, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Well, this forum doesn't have that kind of power. But there are nonetheless things that can be done. And I think there are individual things that can be done, professional things, that is within your professions and your, and your professional associations, and institutional levels to think about. What can you do in your institution? And the key here, it seems to me, came up in one of the small groups that I was part of uh, yesterday, and that is strategic partnerships and all that that implies. Uh, you can, uh, with the background and information that you have from this meeting and other meetings and your own input into that, think about the role of strategic partnerships across professions. That's really the whole raison d'etre of this forum, is working across professions. So you can certainly have an influence on that. Strategic partnerships critical between the education and delivery system, between educational reform and clinical or system redesign. Those two groups of people rarely talk to one another in your institutions, right? And we keep coming back to that in, 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 in workshop after workshop after workshop. So. Think about what you can do to bring the education and health delivery systems or the education reform and clinical redesign communities together. Partnerships, very importantly, between your institutions or professional associations and the community. I mean, very simple things like having community members part of the board, an active part of the board, not a token part of the board. Everyone has them as token parts of the board. But how can you really structure that involvement in a way that's really uh, uh, critical? And the key change agent of all, leadership, 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 leadership. I mean, you've got to get the right leaders, and you can help promote and identify the right leaders, and you yourselves can be leaders of your institutions to do that. So with that, uh, I'll end with a thank you uh, on behalf of Susan Scrimshaw, my co-chair who couldn't be here today, and myself. Uh, I wanted to thank the planning committee, in particular Warren and Aaron, uh, but the whole planning committee actually was very, very engaged in thinking this through. So my thanks to, to all of them, uh, to the speakers, um, many of whom were on the planning committee, but the additional speakers, uh, and most importantly to the audience. I think we had quite a robust interaction yesterday, and I think that's going to continue today. So your input has been particularly helpful, I know, to developing the next iteration and the next iteration and the iteration thereafter uh, of, of the models. And of course, uh, I always need to end by thanking Megan and Bridget and Patricia uh, for somehow taking the morass that, that this forum and the planning committees always seem to dump on their, their, their tables that they somehow sort out. So thank you very much. Aaron, are we going back to you?
Thank you, Malcolm, for those thoughts. I think it, again, sort of gets our minds focused on what we learned yesterday and what we're going to do today. So one of the things we're going to do right now is sort of revisit the model. As Malcolm indicated, this is a living, breathing model. It will need to be refined. And your input yesterday was fantastic. And so what we want to do is capture that feedback and then turn it over to you and say, is this actually what you said? Or, you know, so the planning committee has really tried very hard to sort of synthesize what we think came out of the model yesterday. So we're just going to boot up those slides. So you remember the first part of the model, which was really about having, um, as Edson really laid out so eloquently, we have population health needs on the one hand and the health professions training programs on the other. And really that labor market in between mediating whether those two sides meet. And one of the issues that we heard yesterday from you and our planning committee reflected on last night was that the model lacked a time element that there had to be elements of time in there. And we were trying to work on that last night, and we were still refining it five minutes ago. So here's, here's what I think we heard from you. But, but please you know, engage with me on the element of time. How do you have this model capture time? Well, and the first thing is, is sort of the notion that Malcolm just indicated, that any sort of policy change in health professions financing is going to be incremental, that that's you know, an important piece of it, so that there will be gradual change over the longer term. So we're really sort of mitigating the risk of completely changing the system too fast that we either damage capacity or do something more drastic than we intended. And then there's sort of the, the time scales for implementing some sort of change in health professions financing, right? There would be the short-term change, less than 10 years, which would really address those short-term mismatches. So I think Rob Smith's example yesterday is a really good example of this. So a mismatch in primary care could have taken a long-term view and gone and trained GPs, but you had a workforce there. You were able to sort of retool that workforce. So it's sort of a, a dynamic short-term addressing an issue. And then a medium term to really address a mismatch, which is really you're trying to look 10 to 15 years out. That might be training new physicians, right? Because the time scale for that is about 10 to 15 years. Or it might be trying to fundamentally change on the demand side something in a payment model that's going to take moving to a value-based system here in the United States. Or changing a payment model is a longer term time scale. And then you've got the really visionary change where you think, this is where we want to be more than 15 years out. This is how we're going to fundamentally rebuild this system. So our, our group was thinking, so there's this incremental change and then these short-term, medium-term, long-term. And then another element of, of, of time came up is that, that this model has to be dynamic. It has to respond to feedback loops because there will be, f once you change supply, you may influence demand, and then you're going to get a feedback loop, right? So you have to be, in, in sort of biological systems, you end up with these feedback loops. And so your model is going to have to be responsive to that sort of feedback loop. And then I think the other thing we were thinking is that it also needs to be flexible and contextual. So it depends sort of on where you are in terms of your geography, et cetera. So these are some of the elements we were trying to capture in time, right? So thoughts from you guys around whether you sense time was important, whether you think that the categories that we've just described in terms of t elements of time, that they're short-term, long-term, that there's this feedback loop, and that it's incremental. Are there other elements that you think we need to capture? And how, how we capture this in terms of drawing it on the model, if anyone has any design suggestions, we're open to it, because we were trying to figure out how we do that. So you guys, what do you think? What about time, the time element? Any thoughts? Yes. Just a comment that I think that we have more issue of risk in not moving than in moving too fast. Right, and that might be an element of actually when you're using the model to actually look at what would happen if you didn't move versus if you did move. So that's a nice example of sort of running that through the model and using that as a way to think about the risk of status quo versus some change, incremental or otherwise. Mary. So I think about the technology industry, and I think of how change occurs there. And they don't think in 15-year time frames. Right. And so how, how might we think in even shorter time frames? Mm -hmm. 
And what would it, so what are the barriers to it being quicker and shorter and more responsive? Then I think, you know, the brain, if you start playing around with it, goes to, well, it's the length of the education, or how long does it take to prepare someone? Right. So could you shorten that, and what would that look like? I mean, right. so yes. that, those are the things that I start to think of if you challenge the assumption, yes. your timelines that are right here. So, Marilyn, thank you for that, because that does raise this issue. If you're presented with a problem on the supply side or the demand side, you can sort of think through how fast you want to move and how you might change your options for addressing that. To, you know, for example, let's think about retooling the workforce instead of creating new workers so that we can sort of use the model as a way, again, to help us think through policy options. Does that capture what you're saying? Okay. Right. Comments? Yeah. Bjorn. Yes, I think, you know, I, I, I think time is, is, is obviously an important factor, but in terms of change, are we talking about the change that we implement? I think we're talking to some extent about real shift in focus, in values. Uh, so, so I think as long as you know where you're going, you know, the, the, I worry that if, we, if we're just kind of rearranging the, the chairs on the Titanic, we're not we, we might not get where we're going. So I think that we're talking about real political shifts, and that has to be thought about. How that actually happens will probably take a long time. But I think we have to, 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 to address the, the fundamental shift that's needed really quickly, uh, you know, because that requires real, you know, political uh, thinking. And, you know, we're, we're, we're in this election cycle, which <laughs> we don't know where we'll end. But, right. but I think if we can then offer suggestions uh, that actually reduce cost, that, that is thinking about right. overall, then the timeline on implementation, it will take long. You know, any change takes long. But, but I agree. I think there's so much going on. And that is what has been the problem with education. It has not kept up with health care. And we need to sort of connect with that. So I, I hear a bunch of themes in what you just said, but I want to capture one that intrigues me personally. So I just got back from three months in New Zealand, and one of the things the New Zealand Treasury is doing is taking a social investment approach to health professions education, recognizing that they can put a lot of money in now in terms of intervening early in people's life course and intervening early in the process so that they can have long-run outcomes. Now, that, it, that gets, it's very um, unusual that you're willing to take a political risk in the short term to gain long term outcomes. But I think this model helps think through sort of that exact issue of sort of short term investments that may be very large, having very long term social benefits that reduce costs longer term out. Is that, is that a fair? Yeah. yeah. OK. Are there other comments here on time scales, Joanne? Oh, yeah, my. It is it, looking at the reality of healthcare. It is kind of sad to say short term is ten years. Like really, you know? Yeah. Um, it, yeah like our children thinking in the technology world would say, "You've got to be kidding me." Um, as I look at this model and the conversation, I, I we had some conversation as a um, planning committee to point out that this is not entire, not really a predictive model. It is intended to be really kind of a model or a framework of thinking about where your levers are and where your problems might be. So I just wanted to point that out. Or as, um, as our colleague Jack Needleman at UCLA often says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> and, and this, I think, is intended to be useful to think about, well, where do we have mismatches? Where do we have problems? Are we really trying to affect the supply or the demand here? Is the reason there's a shortage because the demand side hasn't been given sufficient budget to hire, so we have a shortage of services, or do we have a shortage because there aren't enough workers living there, so it's a shortage of supply? Right. And so from that standpoint, then moving into thinking about the time horizons in which, well, if it's this, then could we, do we have levers that will get us there in the short term, in five years, 10 years, two years? Can we solve this shortage crisis in two years for some region? And, you know, so it's really intended to be in that context. And so, you know, I, I think we need to be a little just cautious yep. in what the model can give us and then where, where it's wrong. Excellent. Thanks.
Uh, I'll repeat. I, I like the idea of the, uh, the concept of what you mean by a time change because those of us that have been working in academic institutions for a long time realize it does take this long. And the danger, from my understanding of the change literature and my own experience, is sometimes you get false victories if you don't look at the time it takes. So you may think you're having a change, but then you go around and, and divert to something else, and then the institution goes back the same time. So uh, my experience has been, uh, and I think Malcolm pointed out, that we have to look at incremental changes, but realize that it takes a long time to change a structure, and you have to have that determination, that consistency, a purpose that you need to have on that. And, um, you know, just even defining what you mean by it is a very good discussion because my experience as an academic administrator is most people don't look at it that way, but in reality it happens this way. Um, and it has all the time because if you're going to be an educational institution and institute a change, you're also dealing with health professionals that are already out there right. and they're not going away. So this is really interesting because one of the things we want to encourage people today in using the model to think through these exact examples and help us sort of develop examples that we can use to illustrate the model and, and illustrate this time element. So that's pretty critical. Any other comments over here? The time uh, issue. You know, we, we often explain the difficulty in getting change in education or either in healthcare delivery around the time it takes to produce a healthcare professional. But we don't think enough about the continuum of education, which actually, if a career is 35 or 40 years, right. the time frame we're looking at is actually 35 or 40 years. And most of the education occurs in that continued professional development phase. Right. Right. You know, the, the foundational education, the graduate education, are just little snips of time. And so uh, I, I think the continuum, the need to educate and change people uh, across that whole continuum of, right. of lifelong sort of learning right. issue, it, 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 it gums up the system a lot f more yes. than if we were just dealing with the, the university or school-based education period. I really like that, Malcolm, because it really points out these, you have different policy intervention points along a career trajectory. And so we need to think about where those policy intervention points are and, and the ways that we might intervene. So back here. Classically, Malcolm just trumped me, but I think there's um, uh, another point, which is one thing I've heard is in, when thinking about timescales is you've got a, uh, one that's related to kind of the workforce response, and retooling means you can do that quicker, and I think that's in Malcolm's continuous learning space. The other thing we're worried about is kind of structural change or architectural change like uh, validation or, or registration or whatever that we all fear takes even longer, but they are separate, of course, aren't they? So you may have different tactics and therefore bring your time horizon shorter if you had a more flexible uh, response on the workforce side, i.e. competency-based or modular as opposed to a long program. Term, yeah. But you're never going to change regulation in under five years because it just <laughs> take, you know, so some things are given and some things can, we can, we can do. Thank you. Warren. Uh, an, another, uh, another extension of this, if I think about the examples that were offered yesterday, there are different units of analysis from regions to disciplines to countries, and the time scale will be related to the region, the unit of analysis as well. Right. Really important that, that we think that this model have global um, relevance and that we can think about that um, in terms of time scales as well. So in light, of, in light of Malcolm's comment, I would suggest that while the titles stay the same, I think continuum should be reflected in that little box about health professions education because I think too many times, even if it's in the text of the document, that's not where people go. They go to the foundational. Yeah, so I, I would recommend that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this first slide? And this isn't your only chance to weigh in. <laughs> if you think of something on slide two, perfect. All right, well, let's go to slide two then.
So here's where we were really trying to capture your feedback yesterday on the guiding principles. And I think one of the things we heard loud and clear from multiple groups was that the language responsive to society was a little passive. And so here we really changed that language, given your feedback, to say really accountable, making it active, accountable to society. And we added, so the bits in red are obviously the new bits, um, that we added flexibility um, to this so that you're not only nimble and able to respond quickly, but you're flexible. You're able to respond to change in a way that's appropriate to whatever adaptation you need to make, right? Because the system is, so, is changing so quickly. Um, and then we added diverse, you know, that, that you are really trying to foster diversity, um, whether it's ethnic, racial, you know, uh, linguistic, other diversity, that that be a key guiding principle that we think about when we're, you know, thinking about different changes in health professions um, education. Um, that it be sustainable, that was a really key point that came up yesterday, and I think that's something that will challenge us all because all too often we make these changes, you know, with grant funding or with something, and it actually isn't sustainable. So we have to think about the ways in which we're going to make this sustainable. And some, you know, is sustainability more, more, more? The system has typically tried to say we need more, we need more. And when we get into talking about redistributing money, particularly in graduate medical education, things get very interesting very quickly. Um, so, you know, but that might be a sustainable model or moving towards an innovation fund. So, you know, really thinking about what it is in terms of this health profession's financing policy that we're considering that will make it sustainable. And then the other key thing we heard was accessibility. And, and there we heard accessibility to healthcare services, but also to health careers. And that was something that came up loud and clear. So we're trying to capture it there. Did anyone else raise a point that they feel we need to add? Thank you over here. Good morning. Um, I think our group really emphasized interprofessional. And I know interconnected was all about academia and practice. I don't know what, if you want to put the term interprofessional with interconnected, but I would, you know, advocate for having a, another bullet interprofessional. Inter we have to think of this interprofessionally. Right, getting to the point that was made over here about how, how many anatomy classes did we have and why did we have so many anatomy classes when we could be doing interprofessional anatomy or, we, you know, that we're moving people into, you know, practices that are in clinical placements that are interprofessional. So thank you for that. Good morning. Brenda Zeeler from University of Washington. I. I would like to see community back there because accountable to society sounds great, but if you live in a rural community, the community, the context is so important. So what's good for society is going to look different in different communities. So I think it needs to be brought down to that level. Thank you. And we're going to talk about community on the next page for the actors. And we can think about sort of the links between these two slides too. So thank you for that. So accountable to, to society and communities. So this is perhaps just a thought regarding the model because uh, to, to, I'm just wondering, and I've seen that in other models looking at this, that, that the, there's a step before the health professional education, which is kind of, you know, I, I know it's been called sort of pool of eligible students, mm -hmm. which actually links back to secondary education, mm -hmm. and that that may be something, because that needs to be linked if we want different kinds of workers. You know, the, that education has also, to, it's not only continuing, but also what happens before and who gets into that pool. So I'm just wondering whether that's a, another step ahead. How we would capture that in the model, you know, in, in a guiding principle, sort of developing the pipeline. Yeah. Other thoughts or guiding principles that you think, when you're, again, try to think of an example, if you can, right now, on your feet, and think, okay, what would I want to be thinking about in terms of guiding principles that we want to say everyone should be considering when they're thinking about a change in health professions education financing? Yes, Malcolm. I just want to make a comment about model building in general. One of the problems is you end up with long lists mm -hmm. of things. And the longer we go at this, the longer mm -hmm. will be the lists. And there'll be increasing debates around the, the words, where the commas are. Uh, uh, and, and the reason for that is a lot of these factors, even in this relatively limited list that you have now, right. are, are overlapping and interconnected exactly. in, yes. in that sense. Yes. So, I think it's helpful in, in, in having generated a long, inclusive, hopefully inclusive list, to think of two categories of guiding principles. Uh, what, what, one, one are you know, the 
fundamental or foundational principles like accountability to society. And the other is operational principles, uh, like nimble and flexible, so that you can yeah. create two balloons mm -hmm. right. as opposed to just one balloon. Right. And then each of the two or three or four balloons, if you're going to make headings, uh, so, so think of chapters as well as the content of each chapter, just from building a model that's helpful, and it helps with the language a lot. Absolutely, those are two. Those are great points. The bubbles, and also thinking of the model as a whole. I think I also hear you saying is that some things may be captured someplace else in the, a different chapter too. Oh, yeah. And so that that sort of ability to create a model that hangs together is really important too. Um, I think that also goes to, you know, so it's language and meaning. And, and what I was just striking, we'd had this conversation about who the audience is. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, so the planning committee's had a chance to look at this. So we think we know what those words mean, whereas you've had like five minutes. So, um, so we're thinking, that, sorry, I think that's in box X already. But like Malcolm says, that's not important. You know, you need to explain it to people. But if you're using these words with a different audience, would you yes. use the same words? And I think you need right. to think that through. I think that is really important, and one of the things we're going to get to today is sort of you kind of thinking about how you're going to use this model with your professions or with your organizations or in your context, and you're going to have to describe these principles and sort of play out in your mind how that's going to work out. It's really important. I think back here and then over here. Back here. Can we get you a mic? Yeah, hold one second, please. This relates, I think, to some of the comments we just made, but kind of owning the assumptions on the front end that the model is built within, um, stating up front, having a real honest conversation about what are we assuming to be true. So, for example, I'm thinking about Steve Schoenbaum's, um, Schoenbaum's comment yesterday about, you know, the supply and the quality of the supply, and is it really responsive to change, and is it really meeting the demand and the population and community health needs? So some of this is built on a pretty traditional model in terms of the input or what the professions are, whereas globally they may be very different needs based on that. Right. So again, the, kind of ensuring the global relevance and context. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And then, yeah, over here. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I'm thinking about your comment, Malcolm, about what happened with the IOM report. Um, on changing graduate medical education funding. That you said there were some rel relatively small changes, that, but there was a tremendous backlash that kept those things from happening. And my question is whether or not we're building in um, sort of practicalities in some way. Are we, are we, or can we build into the model in some way thinking about how do we sell this thing? How do we move this thing so we're not just kind of involved in a really nice conversation here um, that, that's going to you know, go smack up against um, the same kinds of resistance that that document had. That's a question. I mean, it came up here in our group yesterday when we were talking about the two debate points, mm -hmm. and uh, the statement was made, you know, maybe when we're thinking about 13 years in 2030, maybe our answer on where you're going to vote should come out of your belief about whether or not we can actually change those political forces in those 13 years so that you actually could have a chance to do the thing that you want to do, because we are all debating what do we mean by social value, right? So anyway, I, I don't know how you would build that in, but it's obviously critical if we're going to move the energy to actually be thinking strategically through the model. Malcolm, do you want to respond and then? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, uh, we all get frustrated at uh, of meetings like this around the perceived lack of action, uh, which I think is what you're addressing, uh, John. But, but, but I would suggest just two things. One, one is, given the uh, accountability to the National Academy of Sciences, which is the organization responsible for this, uh, we can't lobby, we can't take political action as a forum. Um, but you all can as individuals and as leaders of different professions, uh, as uh, leaders of accrediting organizations, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing that says you can't take the information that you've learned at this meeting uh, to other power brokers. Yeah. But this organization, the way this forum is structured, and all the forums are structured, 
It's not a power broker in the sense that I think many of us would like it to be, but it isn't. I mean, we, I think we need to be respectful of, uh, of, the, of what we've been given, uh, which is to discuss and stimulate, mm -hmm. uh, not to do. So there, there's that practical impediment, uh, which I think is an understandable one if you reflect on it for a moment. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't get your institutions, your organizations, uh, your associations more involved. And I would suggest that you need to get politically involved in those organizations. Mm -hmm. I think Aaron has made that point several times in different ways. Right. Thank you, Malcolm. Patricia, you had a comment. The, uh, this didn't come out of the group yesterday. It was sort of an overnight thought. And um, I, I'm wondering if it's a model for the economics of health health professional education. And the reason I say that is that kind of going along with what Malcolm was saying, if you look at it from an economic perspective, not just financing, which is money, <laughs> that um, efficiencies, mm. quality, there are many things that are built in. And going to what Ma Malcolm was saying, it would allow us potentially to not have so many little boxes of guiding principles because what we really are talking about is how the institutions have to be more economically solid in not having duplication and um, that it's not just about the money. You know, it, right. we're trying to weave in all the other things that's not about the money. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just, it just hit me as I was reflecting on this overnight that I'm wondering if we have, and I understand for the purpose of this discussion that we've had to have, we needed to talk about the narrow piece of financing. Exactly. But yeah. in the bigger, broader picture, it really is about the future economics. It's just yep. a re reflective thought. Yeah, that's a really important point. Warren. And I think this applies to both, uh, Patricia, both non-economic elements, but it's got to be um, cost effective as a, as a general principle. And, and when we look at, um, fr from my former days at ARC, that, you know, all of those pieces were in to the economic models, which mm -hmm. was the cost, right. you know, the cost effectiveness, the efficiencies, you know, just many things we've been talking about might make it broader. I don't, it's just, and then in defining the economics of health professions to include, um, you know, the cost issues, uh, you know, all of that, it depends on how you put in your finance, your model, of the, right. it's just a thought. Mm -hmm. Right, no, it's an excellent thought. It also is broader in terms of capturing what might happen on the demand side, rather than, I mean, being focused only on the levers on the health professions education side. So I, I think that's an, it's a, it's an intriguing suggestion. I think the word that, that, that's going to help you is value. Right. Because yeah. in healthcare delivery, we have value-based de delivery, and that, that includes right. both quality and cost. And, cost, yep. uh, and I think value-based education, we don't do value-based education. Right. And I think if we That's incorporate into this the concept of value, it brings automatically, Patricia, the, the cost issue into it as an important, and that's a benefit to society. Right. You can spend money here, you can spend money there, but how efficiently are, are, are you spending it? So I think value is what's missing from this in some sort of, right. I mean, not conceptually, we've talked about that. And it's there, but because it's <laughs> to generate value. I mean, it is, we've talked about value, right. yeah. Yeah. But I like it, too, because it, it also uses language and it takes advantage of language that others are using mm -hmm. in spending, et cetera, and then it makes it very clear what we're talking about. So that's a, that's a you know, great suggestion. Other comments on this slide, principles, before we move to actors? Bjork, did you have a comment or are you just, uh, okay, just waving around? Good. All right. Fantastic. So we'll go to actors next. This is great feedback. Thank you. Exactly what we hoped for. So we had more changes on the actor's side, um, talking about current and future learners. We talked about employers initially thinking about the employers of our product, but then thought, wait, the wider business community we know has a stake in ensuring these outputs. We talked about education systems and then began to sort of di disaggregate. What do we mean by that? We mean the leadership, the faculty in that education system. Clinical systems were brought up. 
as an extra group? I, looking at it this morning, and I ask you, we can talk about this, I sort of see clinical systems as a subset of health systems, but somebody can convince me otherwise. I, I'm wondering, we, that's a point of discussion for this group, uh, whether that is a, a distinct point to Malcolm's point of how many bullets do we want before we get bu bullet weary. Um, bullet exhaustion. Um, we talked about payers, again, disaggregating to not only include government, but not-for-profit and for-profit insurers, including taxpayers. We talked about the individual patient and family, and the, oh, sorry, the individual comma, the patient and the family. We talked about the community and, and Susan's point yesterday, you know, when she was doing her work, who speaks for the community of 70 organizations in a community? Um, how, how, do you, how do you get that community voice? Um, we talked about a commercial lenders who are a really important component right now, philanthropists, policymakers, and political players, which relates to the conversation we just had, community-based financiers, um, especially really important local cooperatives, you know, in globally incredibly important point. And then the media as another potential actor here in terms of, of really playing in this space and helping to, to um, uh, affect change. Any other actors? Did we capture what you tried to reflect to us yesterday? Does anybody want to comment on the clinical systems being part of the health systems or whether we need that ball? Well, to, to me, the clinical system should be a part of the health system, but, but maybe, you know, there could be reason that people see that that's not clear. I think I'm just wondering whether that's captured. A community is such a broad term. You know, when we've talked in, in discussions about sort of the care providers, family members that are care providers that tend to be informal care provider, is that something that is covered by family, or, or is that something that needs to be more defined? Yeah. Warren? Another disaggregation is uh, policymakers and political players. In many of our political units, there are regions that play against each other, and then at the lower level of cities or communities, and that's an important dynamic. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on actors? Any? Yes, Darla. So I don't know that I'm going to be able to help you out in terms of whether clinical systems should be a separate bullet or not. But so yes, it's part of the health systems, but it's it also is part of the education system. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean that's 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 the piece that connects the two. So right, exactly. How to how to we don't want to graph within a bullet, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. The level of disaggregation versus aggregation is critical here. Right. Exactly. Over here. Well, I, I actually understand the separation. At our place, University of Michigan, which has a large health system, it does make sense that at the systems level, you have administrators and so forth, but the actual practice is done at the clinical area. So mm -hmm. you have to have both. So for example, you may have a highly functioning cardiovascular surgery team but not a functioning hospital. And so the, the separation under part, I think I look at it more at the macro level, the policy level, but the actual practice level could be at the clinical level. That's the way I saw it when I see the separation. Okay. I think if you view health system, the, 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 the adjective the health, in its broader sense of health and well-being, uh, as a chapter heading or a balloon unto itself. Mm -hmm. Then clinical systems, and then many non-clinical systems. Think of all the other sectors, uh, the, the, the folks who remove waste from cities. Right. That's part of health. Uh, exactly. Probably far more important than what individual physicians or nurses do, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so there are other sectors that if you define health system broadly, that, that you could put into that particular balloon. So I think, again, yeah. this comes down to subtyping and restrict and, and, and sort of get in your aggregates and then put in the different yeah, pieces under each aggregate. I, I mean, I really think mm -hmm. that's critical for model building. This list is too long. Too long, yeah. And while you've just said it's too long, your th comments just now reminded me of a lot of conversations we had yesterday, which was trying to capture those non-traditional health professions education folks who are out in the community. So where are we capturing? If we say health systems, are we, are we capturing, capturing community services and really trying to, so 
sorry to add more, but that's a critical element here, public health and, and the community-based services that we're not capturing. If you just leave it to clinical, then people are going to think traditionally. They're going to think traditional, but I worry if you keep it to health. non-clinical health-related services. I agree, but I worry if we say health systems, we're going to ex exclude community services because traditionally people haven't thought of that too. So, yeah. So I think we had two comments over here, Patricia, and yeah, we'll go, yeah. Patricia, you... I, I, I think the list is too long, and I see a fair amount of conceptual duplication. I think we should give the committee the opportunity, like, for example, the regulatory bodies, professional association, policymakers, in a way, they're kind of, you know, there's some overlap there. I just think that, you know, just the discussion you've been having in the community and the individual family community, whatever, I think the, you know, your group should take the input we have and get it down through your operational definitions yep. as close as you can get it with the minimal. That was just Thank you. There are lots of comments over here. Uh, yeah, Marilyn. So just trying to put uh, two reports together. Maybe we could look at the discussion we had on social determinants and the bridges, the discussion I think you led yesterday, uh, uh, the other day, uh, Malcolm, and take a look at the groups that we had, mm. which were pretty diverse and out of the traditional health care norm that we should include to make sure that they're included in the actors. So it's just when yeah. the group gets together again, yes. I think looking at that might be helpful. Great suggestion. Other thoughts? Just yep. One other uh, thought, and I'm going to turn this to Patricia mainly. Uh, one other thing that we can do as a group, or at least uh, the planning committee in particular can do, is, is refine this further in whatever direction it thinks is appropriate. That won't be part of the proceedings uh, because this is the, where the proceedings end. What we discuss today will be the end of it. But you can have the opportunity to publish within the Academy's publishing empire a discussion paper. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I keep forgetting as, as mm -hmm. a possibility. But mm -hmm. Patricia, you might want to mm -hmm comment on that because that allows you to evolve beyond mm -hmm. this proceedings of this right. workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely an option and it's, it's one that we've taken up uh, quite a few times to address mm -hmm. some specific issues um, that we want to take on and to continue the discussion on that this is really an opportunity to tee up the conversation and to get a lot of input and ideas and, and to um, to, to try and think through the various issues. But then as far as taking it forward, we do have an opportunity to, to put together a discussion paper, as Malcolm mentioned. And individuals have the opportunity to also think about these ideas and potentially publish in the mainstream journals. So those, those are other options that people have as well. All right. Are there any other thoughts on actors before we switch gears here? Fantastic. And who said writing by committee was difficult? No. I mean, I think we've made great strides this morning in terms of capturing your feedback yesterday, but then also refining it this morning as a group. Really important points and considerations that we can move forward with as a planning committee. Um, perfect. I'm going to turn it over to Warren, who's actually going to take us through the next part of the agenda. Um, Let me take a five-minute break. Five minute break. Okay. And then we'll start and do the rest of the morning right after that break. Thanks.